God of day and God of darkness, now we stand before the night. As the shadows stretch and deepen, come and make our darkness bright. All creation still is groaning for the dawning of your might. When the sun of peace and justice fills the earth with radiant light. Still the nations curse the darkness, still the rich oppress the poor, still the earth is bruised and broken by the ones who still want more. Come and by praying the Anima Christi. This prayer is found at the beginning of the spiritual exercises of St. Ignatius of Loyola. In the name of the Father, the Son, and Holy Spirit. Soul of Christ, sanctify me. Body of Christ, save me. Blood, blood of Christ, inebriate me. Water from the side of Christ, wash me. Passion of Christ, strengthen me. O oh, good Jesus, hear me. Within your wounds, hide me. Permit me not to be separated from you. From the wicked foe, defend me. At the hour of my death, call me and bid me come to you, that with your saints I may praise you forever and ever. Amen. For the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. 
during the introduction, I was listening to some of your stories and the impact of the, this lockdown and uh, how it has affected you, not just merely in terms of the, an increase in terms of the anxiety that you are ex experiencing at your workplace, the future, uh, but also creating, you know, lots of doubts about the future. There has been a great deal of disruption from our so-called old normal. And we are constantly told to adapt to the new normal. And unfortunately, the new normal doesn't feel very normal. It still feels very strange, out of place. Uh, I've often told people that, you know, we, we are social beings and uh, we are not angels. And so therefore, being social beings, we are also tactile beings. And yet we are prevented from touching, from holding, from hugging, from, from, uh, from being close to each other physically, in person. And uh, we have to contend ourselves with, with having such virtual encounters. It's not easy. And in a way, it should be affecting people psychologically, emotionally, because it's impacting an essential part of our humanity, right? The need to be touched and the need to touch. But as working adults too, you know, when, when you're a student, it's a different thing altogether, right? You worry about your studies and, but when you start working, then you think in terms of your own livelihood and people who are your dependents, perhaps some of you also have dependents and they rely on you. Uh, it becomes a little bit more complicated, especially when, when you're not able to work in, in under normal circumstances and perhaps even lose a job or even contemplating the prospect of losing a job. And so this is the age of lockdown circuit breakers and MCO, I don't know what you call it in Australia, right? It's one of these things or many other things, okay? Uh, I, I believe they all mean the same thing. It's just basically a kind of a psychological euphemism just to put people at ease. Uh, just now I was reading the article about the emergency uh, declaration, whether it's going to happen or not. Uh, and it's quite interesting in the, in the newspaper, they mentioned that in, in the cabinet meeting, and I don't know how this got leaked out, right? There was a discussion of giving it a, a more euphemistic uh, uh, touch in the sense of don't use the word emergency. It's going to make everyone panic. And I guess everyone will start rushing for the for the toilet paper in the, in the malls and the supermarkets. So, so it, whatever name we call it, uh, obviously it means the inability to not just move around, but perhaps a disruption even to our work, our normal schedule. And I would like to propose this. And of course, this leads me into a discussion of what a retreat is all about. I would say that a retreat is a Sabbath. And uh, for the Jews, uh, they observe the Sabbath on the evening of Friday. And it's interesting, we're starting on the evening of Friday and all the way to the evening of Saturday. Uh, many of you know the origin of the Sabbath. It's the seven day. So God created the world in the book of Genesis chapter one, God created the world in six days. And as he looked at all of creation, he said, it is very good. Of course, man was created on the sixth day. He was the last of God's creation, the crown of God's creation. And God said, it is very good. A declaration that confirms that God's creation lacks nothing at this point of time anyway. It lacks nothing. It is sufficient. It is perfect. And so God rested. So the Sabbath was, is a constant reminder to humanity, to the Jews, that as much as we strive to improve things, we strive to develop, to progress. I'm not saying that we shouldn't. Yet, and at its very core, God's creation is already perfect. He sees all that is done. 
and it's very good. In a way, when we say that God rests, it is an invitation for us to rest, to cease from work. And, well, a retreat is that. Well, whether you, 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 you've been thinking about it in this way, well, for many of the priests in my discussions with my assistant, Father Dominic, when we first started this, we were, it was in jest, we said, you know, oh, this is going to be a long retreat for us. That was before we started doing our live streaming, the sessions uh, on online platforms and things like that. This is going to be a long retreat for us. And I guess a long retreat for many people. So in a way you have had preparation. Uh, I'm, I'm glad that uh, Rachel and her team uh, had come up with a booklet and she had also been giving some, some pointers of how to prepare for this retreat. Well, I think one way of preparing for the retreat is, is the CMCO itself and, and the lockdown. So how is a retreat a kind of a Sabbath? Well, the word Sabbath or in, uh, in Hebrew is, you pronounce it a Shabbat, okay? The, the B is a V rather than a B, Shabbat. It means to cease, to end, to rest. But it does two things specifically. You see, for a Jew, before the, the beginning of the Sabbath, the first thing would be to prepare the meal. Uh, this is before uh, sundown, okay? Um, the meal will be prepared and two candles will be lit at the table. And whatever light that you need, it would have to be turned on, okay? So today in modern times, Jews continue to do that. They leave the lights on and <laughs> they still light the two uh, Shabbat candles and the, the observant Jews would usually go to the synagogue to have prayers and then they come back for the meal. When the sun sets, what happens? Nothing happens. You can't light the candle, you can't cook, you can't uh, heat up the food, you can't turn on the oven, you turn, turn on any electricity, any, any electrical appliances. Why? Because you are starting fire. And starting fire is actually uh, imitating God's act. Remember, the first act of creation is let there be light. Okay, so the purpose of the Shabbat is to remind man that we, we should not compete with God. And uh, so specific actions are prohibited. Not everything is prohibited, but specific actions are prohibited. Uh, so these two candles have a, have a purpose. The first one is to remember, to remember what God has done for us. And in a way, memory uh, inspires us to be grateful. Notice when you are ungrateful, usually it's because you have forgotten, okay? You know, we celebrate birthdays and anniversaries, this and that. And the reason why we do that is because we remember. And it's a time for celebration. It's a time of gratitude, but you know what happens, isn't it? When your, your, your girlfriend or your boyfriend or someone that, that is close to you forgets your birthday or forgets a celebration, forgets a particular event in your life, you get quite upset with it. Uh, so it's more than just remembering. It's all the emotions, the feelings, the meaning that goes into that memory. So the first candle is the candle of Zakor. It is to remember that God created the universe in six days. God, this universe of ours, this world of ours, we did not make it and therefore we cannot remake it. You know, today we often think about um, man being in control of the universe, being in control of the world. We seem to be, and yet it takes a pandemic like this to remind us that we are actually not in control. <laughs> yeah, we are actually not in control. For the Jews, the Sabbath rest once a week was that rem reminder. As much as someone can be so enterprising, ingenious, and in coming up with all kinds of things, you know, um, adding on to your, your, your profits, uh, moving up in terms of the... Uh, of, of getting an increment or perhaps in terms of, of promotion. And yet in spite of all those things, at the end of the day, it's all just straw. 
in the face of what God has done. So is to remember, to remember how small our contribution is to this whole world. That as much as we think our work is important, at the end of the day, it can never match, match up to the creative work of God who created everything. We can only use what God has created and, uh, and perhaps reshape it. That's all. But without that, that raw material, our works will be not. So it's a powerful reminder, a powerful reminder of the authority and the sovereignty of God, that all things come from God. And the second candle is Shamor. And actually, it's interesting, Shamor is not to cease, Shabbat is to, to cease, to observe. And what are we supposed to observe here? It is the prohibition of the Malachi. Now, the Malachi is not just work. Often it says, you know, you're prohibited from working. If you read the Gospels, uh, you know, very often Jesus gets into trouble because he has violated the Sabbath prohibition on work. But uh, the Hebrew word for it is actually Malachi. And Melaha does not refer to any type of work, but merely to creative work. In other words, Melaha is the work of God. So you're prohibited from doing something. The Jews at least believed in this. You're prohibited from doing something which only God alone can do. So for, for Orthodox, pious, observant Jew, you know, they, they will observe this to the minutest detail, all right, including not starting fire. So what does that mean? You do not start your car, you do not drive your car because there'll be a starting of fire. If you live in a 20 story building and you live on the 20th floor and you do not get into the lift and press the button because that would be starting fire. You do not use your telephone. Every time you use and you switch on your telephone, that will be starting fire okay this is just one of the many things uh the different works that we do different actions that we do which will be a form of rivalry against god so the first one zako is to remember that god is the author and creator of everything it is for us to constantly be grateful and to acknowledge his sovereignty and his authority and the second is to remind us not to compete with god do not try to be God. And so a retreat in that sense becomes uh, a time of grace to do this. Remember I said not every single action is prohibited. During a retreat, we do not cease to remember, to reflect, to re-examine. And so I hope that some of the questions that I'll be posing, if it's helpful, it's helpful. Uh, there are some, some other things that you can reflect upon from the booklet which uh, Rachel has prepared. You can look at that too. Uh, so it's a time to remember, to reflect, to examine your life in the light of God's presence. And certainly it's not the time to stop from spiritual exercises, okay? So during a retreat itself, lots of people, I think some of you have been with uh, having a retreat before. Uh, you've had it with Father Dominic. Uh, not sure who else. I think with, uh, who was that? Uh? Who was the other retreat master you've had in previous years? Father Esmond. Ah, uh, Father Esmond. Uh, yes, uh, yes. Okay, so sorry. <laughs> I need to remember. Okay, so... During a retreat, it's not like, okay, it's time to just stop it from doing anything and everything. No, it's actually quite uh, strenuous, but a different kind of exercise, you know. And it's interesting because when you we look at the word exercise, it means to strengthen something. And so you, it recalls for some level of effort from on our part. So what do we mean by spiritual exercises? And I'll be offering some spiritual exercises in the the various conferences that I'll be giving. Uh, there'll be two tomorrow and one on Sunday. So not, not that many conferences, okay? So what does it imply? First of all, we exercise something that we already possess, okay? 
And uh, I would like to say that, well, in, in the team that I've uh, offered for this whole retreat is that of faith, hope, and charity. And these are the three theological virtues infused in you at the time of your baptism. And you already possess it. It's not like, you know, you have to acquire it over this weekend. You, you don't acquire it. You already have it. If not, then, then these exercises would be pointless. So you exercise something that you already possess. You exercise and practice it so that it may be fruitful. You know, as a person exercises, eventually he hopes to strengthen his muscles. Uh, you know, there will, there, you hope to have a certain result from it. And so we would like to see the fruits, the fruits of, of faith, hope, and charity. Lastly, spiritual exercises are practice in being Christian, practicing living on the basis of faith, hope, and charity. So this retreat is not just merely uh, a retreat from the world, a retreat from reality. What it does is it takes in whatever you have already experienced and we hope that you'll be able to, to take back with you some pointers, some reflections, some insights on how to, to live out these three theological virtues. So, a retreat hopes to seek to, to bring about a kind of a reorientation. You know, the word orient comes from the word east for east. And so, uh, it's actually of Christian origin. Why would we speak of orientation? It actually points to the direction of the mass, the direction of our churches. We face east because it is believed that as Christ ascended into heaven, from the east, he will return from the east, okay? Like the rising sun. I would like to share with you this, this uh, text. And uh, it's taken from the Gospel of Luke. It's about the, the foolish rich man, the parable of the foolish rich man. The story is told in the context of a man coming up to Jesus to ask him to mediate to adjudicate between him and his brother uh you know the the jewish law of pr primogenitor would give a double portion of the inheritance to the older son so he was of course the younger son and he wanted a share of his old, eldest brother's inheritance and, and uh, jesus begins with uh, a statement about uh greed okay and then he tells this parable. I like to tell this parable in the context of, of what's happening to us today. In perhaps for all of us, we, we may be guilty of this. And it's a good uh, starting point uh, to bring into our reflection for this retreat. Then he told them a parable. There was once a rich man who having had a good harvest from his land, thought to himself, what am I to do? I have not enough room to store my crops. Then he said, this is what I will do. I will pull down my barns, build bigger ones, and store all my grain and my goods in them. And I will say to my soul, my soul, you have plenty of good things laid by for many years to come. Take things easy, eat, drink, have a good time. But God said to him, fool, this very night, the demand will be made for your soul and this horde of yours, whose will it be then? So it is when someone stores up treasure for himself instead of becoming rich in the sight of God. The Gospel of the Lord. Okay, this is a familiar parable, right? And, uh, well, with a little introduction by Jesus, which I've not included here, uh, with a saying on greed, the first thing is that, you know, we should not be paying attention to material wealth and should be concentrating more on spiritual things. Seems to be an easy a way of describing it. But I would like to, to take it as, as a description of the condition of modern men. Uh, right until the almost the, the last 
the second last sentence. Notice something is, is absent. And there's irony here. You know, the gospel is full of irony. The man in this parable is enjoying a great surplus, a great surplus. And yet there is a great deficit in his life. Throughout that whole first part of the parable, it is a description of a man who talks to himself. There's no mention of his family. There's no mention of friends. It's just him. Perhaps you can say his material wealth. But he seems to be having this conversation with himself. Ruminating on how would he deal with his wealth. And in fact, in a way you can say he's quite an enterprising genius kind of a mini Trump, all right? He's got big plans ahead and he wants to enjoy himself. And, and, and when you look at this, rather than to look at it with, with, with judgment and to say, wow, this man is just so materialistic, but there's a little bit of that in, in each of us, right? We work and we want to have a good life. And come on, we enjoy eating, drinking, having a good time. And the reason why we work hard is because we want a little bit of this. And, um, but the thing that is missing from his surplus, his massive surplus, is this deficit, the deficit of God. And God breaks into his silence at the very end, the second last sentence. God said to him, fool, this very night the demand will be made for your soul and this hoard of yours, whose will it be then? Now notice that the words of God seems to be wrapped in a kind of a, a contractual thing. You know, this man thinks in terms of business. So he's in his mind is the language of contracts, the language of, of law, the language of accounting. And God comes to him and speaks to him in that language, but reminds him that there is a different kind of an accounting, an accounting for his soul. Perhaps he would have been, been successful in drawing up contracts with other people in order to show up his business. And yet he had failed in his contract with God. What does this say to us about modern men? It tells us a little bit about the paradox of human existence. One of the things is that we, we are constantly trying to to fill up an emptiness in us. And, you know, we always have targets. You know, when I, when I arrive at this stage, I want this, I want that. And when I've arrived at it, well, it doesn't seem to be enough. But there is an illusion, an illusion that, that we, we have it. So the first paradox is he who believes that he lacks nothing actually lacks everything. The second paradox is this, in order to have a sense of a world beyond this, there must be an existence, existential sense of lack. We must feel a certain kind of inadequacy. There must be, a, we must be in touch with the emptiness in our lives, with the whole in our lives, in order to be in touch with God, with what lies beyond this world. The problem is that we often fill that hole of ours with all kinds of surrogates, substitutes, trying to fill it up. And you know, and when you fill yourself up with all kinds of junk food, you have no room for food that will nourish. So today, yes, there is an ex existential sense of lack, but but modern man is filling it up with all sorts of things, all kinds of substitutes, thinking that he can fill that hole. And when he, well, sometimes he thinks he has successfully filled that hole, but in a way he has kind of cut himself off from this link with the world beyond this, beyond our horizon. The third paradox now we're moving into the theological virtues already. 
When you trust only yourself, you trust no one. When you trust only yourself, you trust no one. So that's the lack of faith. And I think today, lots of people suffer from this. It's not just merely people without religion, people who do not believe in God. We really live in a world where there is a deficit of trust. We don't trust our politicians. We don't trust the scientists. We don't trust the science, you know. In America, there's this whole big discussion rhetoric going on between trusting the science, facts, fiction. The point is that lots of us have lost trust in anything and everything, including religion. So when you trust only yourself, and also I think we have doubts even about ourselves, you trust no one. When our happiness depends only on personal success, we measure our happiness based on success. Then, what happens when we fail? We enter into despair. And actually, perhaps the greatest malady that is afflicting our world today is this. There is so much despair. Despair which sometimes is apparent. Sometimes you can see people despairing. You know, one of the funny things I, you know, if you've been following, I've been following <laughs> the politics in the United States, and it's quite interesting to see uh, the two sides of the political aisle, uh, the Democrats and the Republicans, the conservatives and the, the liberals. And you see one side is the, the side of optimism, and the other side is the side of pessimism. You know, the other side is saying, you know, that this is the land of promise. This is the best country in the world, you know. And the other side is saying, oh, it's the worst country. Everything is going to end. It's a disaster. We, we are so quite funny, you know. And, and you may be thinking that, well, you would want to be on the side of optimism. But actually, I will be talking about this tomorrow. Optimism is a disguise for pessimism. All right. We hide our despair, actually. The, the Malaysians have a way of describing this, okay? Which of you, shock sindiri, you know, to shock yourself, self-shock. Uh, how would you explain uh, that? Uh, <laughs> shock sindiri, like you are full of, your, your, full of yourself, no? Uh, you excite yourself. <laughs> self... Um, Okay, okay. <laughs> you get the idea, isn't it? That, you know, if, if you, uh, to make yourself feel big and good about yourself, to make yourself feel good about yourself, right? So we do all kinds of stupid things, silly things to do that, all right? But we know it's not real. It's, it's just fake, okay? And as soon as we, as we, uh, okay, now let me move this up here. As soon as something happens and we are not able to cope with it, immediately the despair, it's not like we, we, are, we oscillate between despair and then hope and things like that, you know. It is despair, basically, under guise or, or apparent. And so when, when a crisis hits us, then the disguise has been thrown off. Lastly, when you are self-sufficient, you cannot see beyond your own navel, all right? And I think that was the problem with the rich man in the parable, so you lack charity. So we're gonna consider this in terms of our own personal lives. Who do we trust? Where do we find happiness? Where do we find our sufficiency? And, uh, Uh, okay. So the three theological virtues, what are they? Well, you will find these virtues also in the uh, in the writings of Aristotle uh, and uh, Thomas Aquinas will build on it. Uh, what is a virtue in the first place? A virtue is a habit of good, uh, just as vice is the habit of sin. 
you know, people, when people go to confession, generally they say, you know, you have to confess your sins. But most of the time, what people are actually doing is they are confessing vice because you're always confessing the same thing, the habit of sin, all right? So whatever we are struggling with often comes in the form of a habit. And what does a habit do? Well, a habit makes certain things, we think of it in terms of repetition, but actually a habit predisposes us to do something easier. So if a sin, a single sin on a single occasion, you have never done it before and, and, and you do it, you will feel extremely guilty about it. All right, immediately you run off to see the priest for confession. But say you've done it the first time, it was terrible, and you do it the second time, and then the third and the fourth. And every time you repeat it, it becomes much easier, right? It becomes less difficult. That's what a habit is all about. Same thing is like if, you, if you're on a particular diet, the first time will be very difficult. But after a while, if you continue to repeat it, the level of difficulty decreases and it makes it much more easier to do something. So a vice is the habit of sin. The virtue is the habit of doing good. So virtues actually help. We have the human virtues and the, the hu human virtues are prudence, temperament, temperance, fortitude, and justice. Okay. When we speak of it as human, it means that it's common to all humanity that we can exercise, we have the capacity in both our intellect and our will to, to be prudent, to make wise decisions, to have fortitude, to be courageous, uh, to act justly, and lastly, to be balanced. Temperance means to be balanced. We have the capacity to do that. And if we exercise it, we develop these habits, they become virtues, human virtues. But the theological virtues are different. They, we, we can exercise them, and that's why they're also called virtues. But they're called theological because they are gifts from God. Without God's gifting, we will not be able to possess faith, hope, and charity. So they are infused in us. We'll show you a little bit from the catechism. Huh? Just This is a little bit of uh, information you in your reflections okay so what are these three virtues there are three virtues which are the source of salvation for men to heaven faith hope and charity when one is lacking from these virtues they become useless so they are intertwined eh? it's not like okay i want the virtue of faith or i need the virtue of hope i need the virtue of charity in practicing the virtue of faith one immediately also have to practice the virtue of hope and charity. So when one of these virtues is lacking, the others become useless. If man would disregard one of these three, the remaining will be useless for the salvation of his soul. Okay? So sometimes I hear people say, you know, oh, I, what I need is faith. And actually when you listen to him, actually what he needs is all three. Okay? That there is a certain sense of despair there, which means that he lacks hope. And because he lacks hope, he has turned in onto himself. It affects his relationship with God and with others too. The devil, for example. Does the devil lack any of these virtues? Well, actually, the one virtue which the devil does not lack is faith. The devil believes in God. But what the devil lacks is hope and charity. And as a result of that, that faith cannot be a guarantee for his salvation. All right? So you need all three. <clears throat> this is from the CCC to just kind of expand on what I've just said. The theological virtues adapt man's faculties for participation in the divine nature. For the theological virtues relate directly to God. They dispose Christians to live in a relationship with the Holy Trinity. They have the one and triune God for their origin, motive, and object. So if you want to grow in your relationship with God, lots of people talk about that. Okay, I want to grow in my relationship with God. And so very often people will say, okay, you know, you go to the sacraments, you, you, you have a life of prayer, and all these things are true. It's important. But actually, at the end of the day, what we need to, 
to really concentrate and, and look and pay attention to are the virtues, the theological virtues. They are lifeline to God. We need, they, they, it makes it, how would I say, predispose us to the life of prayer, predispose us to the life of sacraments. So when we are not exercising these three virtues, that's when we stop praying. That's when we stop coming for Mass. That's when we, we, we stop believing in things, in, in God. The theological virtues are the foundation of Christian moral activity. They animate it, give it its special character. So in, in our decisions, in our actions, in what we do, what is right and what is wrong. They inform and give life to all the moral virtues. They are infused by God into the souls of the faithful to make them capable of acting as his children and of meriting eternal life. They are the pledge of the presence and action of the Holy Spirit in the faculties of the human being. And there are three theological virtues, faith, hope, and charity. So here's a little summary. Faith is the virtue by which we believe in God and in all that he revealed to us. Hope, the virtue by which we trust God, will, fu will fulfill his promises and look forward to eternal life. And charity, the virtue by which we love God above all things and our neighbors as ourselves. In a way, we can see its connection in terms of our own lives, okay? Faith points to the past, hope to the future, and charity to the present. Now, um, there's a question here for your personal reflection. If you find it useful, you can use it. I'll be offering some questions for reflection after every conference. Um, as I said, it is just an aid for your own personal prayer and meditation. If you do not find the, these questions helpful, you can just ignore them, okay? So how has this pandemic challenged me? What can I say about my current state in terms of faith, hope, and charity? Okay, I, I will share this, these slides with you. Uh, so I think Rachel will share it with the group, okay? later. So you can have a look at the questions. You don't have to take it down. Now, um, I'll be using a set of gospel readings. I would like to focus on the person of St. Peter, but it, the, the, St. Peter is not the real protagonist of the story. The protagonist of the story is always Jesus. Okay. And in considering these stories using a method of Lectio Divina, I would like to propose a kind of a, a methodology for the spiritual exercises, okay? So this is just laying down the, the, the methodology when we, when we do a Lectio Divina of each of the passages. And the methodology actually comes from this episode on the healing of the blind man. As he drew near to Jericho, a blind man was sitting by the roadside begging, and hearing a multitude going by, he inquired what this meant. They told him, Jesus of Nazareth is passing by. And he cried, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And those who were in front rebuked him, telling him to be silent. But he cried out all the more, son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stopped and commanded him to be brought to him. And when he came to him near, he came near, he asked him, what do you want me to do for you? He said, Lord, let me receive my sight. And Jesus said to him, receive your sight. Your faith has made you well. And immediately he received the sight and followed him, glorifying God and all the people when they saw it, gave praise to God. You can see that there is a certain progression in this the story of the healing of the blind man. 
the first part of, of this process of healing is this, is the ability to see myself. So a retreat is a wonderful time for introspection, for us to look at our own lives, look at what's happening, take an honest look at ourselves in relationship to God. Okay. The second would be to see what are the obstacles in our path, not just ahead of us. Perhaps we are already at the, at the end of the road and it's kind of a dead end. There's a wall ahead in front of us and we're not able to move on. So it's a time to also look at the obstacles. And then, then there's an invitation to look up and to see Jesus. The appearance of Jesus on the scene changes everything. All right? And finally, we hope to see the way forward. Okay? So as our Lord gave this invitation to the the first two disciples in the Gospel of St. John, which were the disciples of John the Baptist, when it came to, to, to him, the invitation was very simple, come and see. So this would be my invitation too, as we enter into this retreat and spend a fruitful time with the Lord during this weekend. Okay. Thanks, Robert.